The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. Nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the prophetic words of the prophets of the past, for the angelic words of your servants, and for those who believe who trusted somehow your power in the midst of the world. We pray that you would help us. As we have received your Holy Spirit, we pray that faith might grow in us. As we hear your word this day, as we receive the meal, strengthen us so we know your word and your will and by your spirit have strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, there are things that we don't always talk about. I mean, a sermon could be a little longer and I could cover it all, but I understand there are limits here. And so therefore, I didn't mention last week's Sunday. I mean, I mentioned the Sunday, but not the Sunday. Do you remember what the Sunday is? I'll give you 53 points. If you can tell me the Latin name for last Sunday, you will have the hint of the pink candle that was lit last Sunday. That's the giveaway. Purple candles, repentance, this bright, cheery one. Gaudete, of course. Now it comes back to you. Gaudete, rejoice uh, from the old introits when we used to use introits. Uh, it's, a, it's a hangover. Well, I, I will give you 53 points other than the doctor uh, or nurses or the pastors. Okay, there are a few of you who maybe can answer this and get some points. Only if you don't know the answer. I'm going to tell you what today is, and you tell me what it means. All right? Easy enough. Strabismus Sunday. This is Strabismus Sunday. Anybody? Do you know, do you, do you know Strabismus? Anybody remember Harold uh, Humphreys? Harold Humphreys was a member of our church. He was a great guy, I'll tell you. He had more fun with life than anybody I know. Harold was a thriving guy, AAL guy, everything else. He and Goethe uh, were around. And Harold had this gift where he could stand in a group of people and he would put himself in such a position that he could be talking to two people at the (laughs) same time. His eyes 
would go in different directions. <laughs> and you never knew when he'd say, well, how you been doing? And two people would be under the sweats to try to figure out who he was talking to. Anybody remember? Is that not Absolutely. true? Absolutely. That's strabismus. Yeah, it's a gift. Harold enjoyed it to no end. Today is strabismus Sunday. <laughs> we are looking in two directions at the same time. Because officially, liturgically, and if I don't mention it, they'll pull my card, this is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It really is. But you know, and I know, we got one foot in Christmas, right? I mean, if you haven't gotten your cards off, your stuff in the mail, the presents bought, you are in real trouble. Because this, in the daytime, is Christmas Eve. Now, this is crucial. I, I, I was at a loss. I struggled. I wrestled at night with an angel. I threw out my hip. I mean, I struggled with this. What are we going to do about this Sunday? Because we actually, years ago, lost a family <coughs> over this kind of issue. I mean, it's serious. I, I, I'm being serious. I, they, they, you know, we had been through Easter, great services, everything else, and I noticed for like a month afterwards, I didn't see this family that was regularly there. So I called, left the message, didn't hear anything, and then, you know, bold as I am, I stopped by. And I said, I've missed you, guy. Everything all right? Anything, you know, I can say all kinds of things that might offend somebody if I did. Uh, he said, no, it was Easter. <laughs> okay, so Easter is now the culprit. So Easter, yeah, I said, what happened on Easter? He said, well, I went to church, and you didn't sing any of the Easter hymns. I you know, I'll be accused of lots of things, but on Easter, we really do sing a lot of Easter hymns. No, no, I didn't come on Sunday morning. I came on Saturday. Some of you graciously are still here after having done the liturgical faux pas uh, of, of being out there on the edge. Anybody remember what we will call the Saturday night service before Easter? We call it the Easter Vigil. It's not even close. A real Easter Vigil is three hours long, and it is, in the historic church, the time when baptisms took place, okay? But, but here we are on Saturday, Holy Saturday. You know, and I know, he's still in the tomb, right? He's, he's still in the tomb, and so the idea of uh, Jesus Christ is risen today, it, it just was hard. Oh, uh, Missouri Synagogue, I am, I couldn't do it. And so we had a little bit. We started in the tomb. If you'll remember, we advertised it. I, I, it was six ways to Sunday, six ways to Easter. I explained, we're going to start in the tomb, and then we're going to move, and we're going to reflect on our baptism, and then we will celebrate at the end of the service his resurrection. I thought that was a compromise on my part. Uh, not a sufficient one, however. Uh, the family never came back over hymns. So it is with fear and trepidation I do a Strabisma Sunday uh, where it is the fourth in deference to the candles. Uh, it is the fourth Sunday of Advent, but we know it's also Christmas Eve. And so we're going to look in two directions. We are going to look at the preparation. It is God's gift to us that we have this time, this morning, to still prepare. We don't go shopping, we're doing anything else, but a way to prepare for the coming of the Lord, to let him come into our hearts. It's too late to do any of the rest of it. You're not putting any lights up this afternoon. You're not gonna, you know, I mean, all the rest, we're down to the last few minutes. And what we really want is for Christ to come and make his home in us. So what I'm going to do is look at two, just, just two figures. Uh, one is Isaiah in his proclamation, but I want to begin with Mary. Mary is a little bit like us on the fourth Sunday of Advent, just minding her own business, doing her own things, excited about the prospect of being married to this older guy. Uh, you remember when you were engaged, right? I mean, all your thoughts were thinking about, oh, you know, children and everything else. And in the midst of this, an angel appears to Mary. Now, I don't know if, if you know, what her reaction to the word was. I assume it was similar to those of us who went through the 60s and the Vietnam War days when you got a letter that was began, greetings. Anybody else have that letter? <laughs> yeah, that's not like, hi, how you doing? That is, um, you've got a number, and uh, we want to see you downtown tomorrow because, uh, uh, so 
the, the angel says, very friendly like, greetings, O favored one. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I would have a feeling if an angel, I've not had one come, other than you, all angelic beings that you are, uh, but I'm, I mean one of those messengers of God has not come, but if he did, if he did, or if he came to you, what would you think he would be talking about? Would he be, would he be saying, listen, I just wanted to stop by and confirm your, your sacred work, your holiness, boy, it, it resounds to the heavens, perfect job, high five, see you later. Anybody think the angel would talk to you like that? I got a feeling it's going to be more down to earth. I think uh, I'd probably if he starts to talk while the door is open, I'm going to go close the door because I'm going to hear what change is needed. They don't appear without a change. God brings his word in order to renew us or restore us or change. We just live day after day after day after day. The auto accident, you know, you see the bright light, you're, you know, you're on the table and starting to move, and, and no, not yet, and, and all of that. That will bring about a change in life. I expect Mary's life was never quite the same after Gabriel comes to her. Gabriel had also been to Zechariah and her cousin Elizabeth. Uh, these angels, they are something else. They are, by their nature, their job description, that one that goes up in heaven, anybody want to be named? It's a messenger. Your only assignment is to take the word of the Lord and bring it to people and let them know what the Father's will is. And comes to Mary and says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to bear a son. Now, I, do you ever visualize these things? All I can picture is Mary sitting there going, yes, you know, this guy is old, I'm wondering, you know, and male, I'm getting a son, not a daughter, because, you know, in those days, that was not such a, you know, oh, uh, to get a son, oh, and it is great, and you're going to name him Jesus. Wait a minute, we, my, my husband would pick the name, you're telling me the name has already been. And Joshua, um, the Hebrew would be Joshua. You know, it, it flows off the tongue, you know. I don't know what her last name was, you know, Smith, you know, jo Joshua Smith. I, I can make that work. That's good. But if you're telling me his name, it probably is related to his role. What he does. He's going to be named Jesus, Matthew records, because he's going to be savior of his people. The people need saving. The Savior, Jesus, is going to do his work. He's going to be great. Every parent, you remember when you looked at your baby, they were born, you know, and you're looking and saying, what are you going to be? What are you going to do in the world? How are you going to make an impact? Will you make us proud? You know, the dads are all, well, I think he's got muscles. Could be NFL. You know, <laughs> you know smart, sing, hums comes right down with music. Maybe he's going to be a musician, an artist. Oh my God, you dream the dreams. This one is going to be great. He's going to be Savior. He's going to be called the Son of the Most High. Now, I would expect at that point, Mary has a chill. This one is unlike anyone else. Nobody else gets called Son of God. Higher than the angels. He has a name that no one else gets. Well, there is this problem because I'm a virgin and I'm engaged to a guy and how will this happen? You're going to be overshadowed by the power of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and the one born of you is going to be holy, perfect, the Son of God, not the Son of Joseph. At this point, I can imagine Mary being just slightly off kilter just wondering and asks <laughs> are, are you sh I'm Mary I don't know if you mean the, the, there's a really mature lady next door who's very I mean she's all the time praying and stuff you're not really talking about using me yeah using me if you are so willing and Mary's response here am I not here I am, Yahweh would be the name there. Here am I, a servant of the Lord. My favorite um, spiritual writer, a Trappist monk, a Lutheran married guy has a favorite writer, a Trappist monk, Thomas Merton, 
he has a chapter in his book, New Seeds of Contemplation, and he talks about Mary. And he really is scolding the Roman Catholic readership that he has and saying, you know, it's really too bad what we are doing. When we are really focusing on stuff from Mary that, that is not scriptural and, and, uh, and, and it, it's not the point. Mary's witness to us is her humility, her willingness to be a servant of the Lord. That's the question. When the Lord comes, when the Lord Jesus comes, if our hearts have been prepared, if we're ready, if we're identifying with Mary and he says, I've got something for you to do. I want you to forgive that person who sinned against you again. I want you to love your enemies. I want you praying for those who are persecuted. Not getting them back. Not getting a lawyer. Not, not anything other than praying for them. Us? Sinners that we are? Yes. It would take some power. It would take some power. But since we were baptized into Christ Jesus, and will be baptized into Christ Jesus, into the powerful one, into the Son of God. And Christ lives in us as we live in him. We have the power placed upon us. That's what Jesus said. No, you guys can't do it. Don't worry about trying to be a witness in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth until the power from on high comes upon you. But when it does, then you will be my witnesses. The world will look around at a time of division and hatred and anger and viciousness and say, look at them. They will recognize Jesus in us. They will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Forgive one another again and again. The way you welcome and embrace one another. Mary is that model for us having no particular skills, abilities, other, other than hearing the call and responding. Responding to the one that was prophetically uh, spoken about. It's not surprising that Isaiah would be a lead book of the Bible for the Christian, of the Bible. The New Testament has not been written. When they read their word, it is Isaiah who speaks over and over again about this child, this one who is coming, this one who will be a wonderful counselor. You want advice? Not the rabbi down the street. The word of God, this word made flesh, will see his life and listen to the word made flesh. He will speak to us and advise us. He will tell us what is true. Where do you go for what's true? Chris and I went to Barnes and Noble this last week. They got self-help books everywhere. If you want help with something, you want to be a millionaire by next year, you, there's a book for that. There's a whole raft of books on that. Whatever you want to do, the books will guide you. How does that work for you? Th that would mean that our desires, corrupted by sin, can be empowered by the advice of others who have been there before us. So you can get a book from Bernie Madoff, How Not to Get Caught, which is, you know, we've been working on that since we were kids, right? You know, I'm really sorry I got caught. I'm really sorry I ate that cookie because I, you know. What will the good advice look like? What is true? That was the question at the beginning and the end. This one who is the way, the truth, and the life is asked by Father. What is truth? Nobody knows that. I am the truth. We look at Christ, we listen to him. This one advises us for our entire lives. Every stage of life. The truth for us. I, I, I want to check. Maybe it's out there, I just haven't, haven't found it yet. Has anybody ever read a book that, that um, warns about the dangers of wealth? Hmm. This book says... Boy, if you get too much, it's going to be trouble for you. Anybody read one of those books? How about the Bible, Carl? Carl, am I, I got an order here in my sermon. Wait. Have you read it in a Barnes & Noble book? No, just how to get more. But the word says the truth. The love, it is either true or false. The love of money is the root of all evil. 
you got a problem going on, you're wondering why people are doing this or nations are doing that, that corruption goes to our hearts. He will tell us the truth. And the truth will set us free. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God. I mean, what didn't he do? Still in storms, walking on water, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, born blind, not a problem. You name it, he could do it. This is the one that we live in. So when you start to feel, this is great, this is all, when you feel incompetent, when you feel as if there's no possibility, it, this is impossible, you hear the words of the angel, with God everything is possible. Without him, of course not. But when the impossible happens, then, then realistically we would have no choice but to say thanks be to God. There's no hope. Anybody see the news last night? 6.30 NBC, we usually have it on. Ended with the story of that woman who was in a coma, the grandmother, daycare worker. Yeah, she was, she, it was terrible. Had this disease in the brain and all, and it was finished. No brain activity, just laying there, and the family finally said, that's it. That's it. So they took away, gathered the family, pulled the plugs, and she went on a day and two days and another couple of days and another couple of days. No water, no food. I, as I remember the story, Chris, maybe it was it 12 days. On the 12th day, she says, anybody got any water? <laughs> yeah, it was all on the floor, you know. Oh, oh Grandma, you know, just... Now, the nurse, I guess a nurse or a doctor there at Mayo, at Mayo, uh, says, you see a lot of things. Um, this is a miracle. And that's not always what people say. Must have been jolt or something. And there's the picture at the end, feeling good about America with the woman with her... Uh, kids and her family and she's saying you know uh, people were promising all kinds of things grandma if you get better we're going to do this <laughs> we're going to las vegas <laughs> what that had to do anyway not the the mighty god is the one we follow and the one we serve he is the everlasting father you look at me you're going to see the father you want to know what god is like watch my love for you willing to go to the cross for you I can give you this everlasting kingdom. That's what I'm about. This life is passing away. That kingdom will never end. And I am the Prince of Peace. The peace of God which surpasses human understanding. The peace which the world cannot give. The peace which any of us would want. We try to get around as pastors. We try to get around to see people we haven't seen, haven't been around for a while shut-ins especially, and I went to see one, and I said, how's it going? You got the family will come. He says, yes, I, I have two Christmases. I said, oh, that, it's great, out of town, people coming in later or something. He said, no, no, my daughters haven't talked to each other for years. So we have to have two. <coughs> Christmas dinner. When the Christ child moves us, it changes us. And the Christ child lives in us, then our, our lives are lived as servants of the Lord. I pray that wherever you are, probably four o'clock at the worship down to late, oh no, there's something conflicting, um, but wherever you are tonight, tomorrow, that the good Lord comes and makes his home in your heart. If you can join us here, but may the Lord bless each of us as we seek to serve him. Set aside the hindrances of our sin and let the Lord be born in us today. I pray that for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. We take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.